I'm happy to see that uh, Tom Khalil had his usual electrifying effect on the crowd. Uh, I'm John Holdren, President Obama's Science and Technology Advisor and Director of the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy. It's my pleasure on behalf of President Obama to welcome you all uh, here to the White House for this uh, very important event on broadband networks. Uh, and what an amazing crowd it is. I've just had the pleasure of mingling for a while uh, with some of the folks in the room. It is really uh, an amazing high-powered collection of uh, influential folks in the broadband and IT community and in uh, local and regional and state governance, uh, corporate world from around the country. Amazing, amazing collection of people, academics. Uh, we've got the whole nine yards here, and that's just what the president loves. The word partnership has been uh, a key word for the president from the beginning of his administration. His notion that we need all hands on deck and all hands linked to meet the great challenges uh, that we face and to take advantage of the great opportunities. Uh, before we get started, uh, I do want to acknowledge uh, a number of my colleagues in the federal government who are helping to lead this effort, uh, including uh, Dr. Subra Suresh, the director of the National Science Foundation, whom I'll turn the podium over to in a moment. Uh, Julius uh, Janikowski, the chairman of the Federal Communications Commission. Uh, and I see you must have just arrived, Julius, because when I looked around a moment ago, you weren't here. But uh, glad, glad, <laughs> glad, glad, glad to see you made it. Um, Larry Strickling, the administrator of the uh, Commerce Department's National Telecommunications and Information Administration. Larry down here in front as well. Uh, I particularly want to thank uh, Nick Maynard of uh, the OSTP staff. And of course, uh, <laughs> so obviously you all know uh, what a key role Nick has played uh, in organizing uh, this initiative and this event. And of course, uh, although it's not in my talking points because Tom Khalil wrote my talking points, the incomparable Tom Khalil, my deputy uh, at OSTP, who is an engine of creativity uh, and ideas, uh, and most importantly, implementable ideas. I know a lot of creative people, but many of them can't tell the difference between an unimplementable and an implementable idea, and Tom Khalil can, and that's why uh, he gets so much done. Um, as this audience knows, uh, broadband networks are absolutely critical to America's economic future. In the same way that we invested in the transcontinental railroad and the interstate highway system, we need a communications infrastructure that is second to none. Uh, as the president has said, uh, this isn't just about a faster internet or being able to find a friend on Facebook. It's about connecting every corner of America to the digital age. Uh, today we're making two important announcements uh, on, the, on the road to achieving that goal. First, the president uh, is issuing an executive order that will make it easier for industry to build broadband infrastructure on federal lands and in federal buildings. That's going to reduce the cost of deploying broadband networks, going to spur investment, economic growth, and job creation. For example, when the Department of Transportation is investing in the construction or repair of a highway, the private sector should be able to take advantage of that opportunity to deploy broadband hardware as opposed to digging up the highway again uh, three months later. This is smart policy. It's going to make a big difference. Uh, second, we're launching today U.S. Ignite, uh, a collaboration between the public and private sectors that will demonstrate the ability of ultra-fast broadband networks to transform education and workforce development, health care, clean energy, advanced manufacturing, public safety, transportation, and more. Uh, in the same way that email and the World Wide Web drove demand for today's internet, U.S. Ignite is going to help entrepreneurs and researchers create the applications that will drive demand for the Internet of the future. Our 21st century networks will not only be hundreds of times faster than today's, they will be more flexible and able to support applications that we can only dream of today. Uh, we have, as I've already indicated, a remarkable uh, coalition coming together to make this happen, uh, represented by the people in this room. Coalition includes 11 leading information and communications companies providing funding, equipment, pilot sites, and expertise, 60 research universities, 25 communities, nonprofits, and foundations, and nine government agencies. America has long been the leader in the information age. We're the birthplace of the transistor, the computer, and the internet. 
our entrepreneurs are always developing the next new thing, whether it's internet search engines, cloud computing, smartphones, or social media. And working together, I have no doubt that Americans will continue to lead the next wave of innovation. Uh, and now it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Subra Suresh, director of the National Science Foundation, an agency that, of course, is playing a central role in this initiative. Indeed, NSF has played a critical role in the development of the Internet uh, overall through its support of NSFNet in the 1980s and 1990s. Its digital library program funded two Stanford students, two Stanford graduate students, who went on to found Google, a company that is now worth $190 billion, which, by the way, would pay for the NSF computer science research budget for the next 292 years. <laughs> so uh, let us uh, welcome Dr. Subra Suresh. Thank you, John. Uh, good morning, everyone. I want to thank you on behalf of NSF uh, for attending this. Uh, as John said, the U.S. has been a leader in scientific research and innovation for at least uh, 60 years, and probably much longer. In addition to the things that John mentioned, we can think of other innovations. Functional magnetic resonance imaging, meteorological Doppler radar, nanotechnology, of course, web browsers, search engines, etc. They've been paradigm shifting examples. They also affect billions of people across the globe in different corners of the planet. There is one thing common about all of the things that I mentioned. All of these life changing technologies can be traced to support for basic research by the National Science Foundation. NSF has a long history of creating and cultivating innovative ideas that lead to advances that shape and touch our everyday lives. As John mentioned, the internet began as a research tool and grew into unprecedented game-changing engine of economic development. We at NSF continue to foster such collaboration to jumpstart the next revolution in networking. Over the past year, NSF has worked with the Office of Science and Technology Policy, OSTP, and other federal agencies to convene representatives from academia, industry, and bro broadband providers. The purpose was to explore possibilities for how best to advance applications and services for next generation, uh, high, next generation high bandwidth networks, not just local networks, but across the country. To this end, I'm very proud to announce today that NSF serves as the lead agency for US Ignite. US Ignite will leverage NSF's investments in GINI, which stands for the Global Environment for Networking Innovations. The GINI network, developed and prototyped by more than 300 researchers, and 60 universities all across the country, allows exploration of high, ultra high speed and software defined or programmable future internets. The US Ignite Endeavor will integrate Gini enabled academic campuses with research backbone networks and broadband enabled cities across the United States. This integration will enable a next generation gigabit capable network at a national scale. The programs and applications that exploit the functionalities of these advanced networks have tremendous potential to address the grand challenges that society faces today. I'm also pleased to announce that NSF has made 10 so-called eager awards, which stands for early concept grants for exploratory research to date to show what is possible. So let me give you a few examples. Mike Zink and his team at the University of Massachusetts, Amherst, are demonstrating the benefits of connecting radars to ultra high speed networks to improve weather prediction. 
this application will mitigate the impacts of natural disasters. A team led by Mart Kubik at the University of Missouri, Columbia, is exploring the potential for detecting changes in health conditions using unobtrusive in-home sensors. This application may extend independent living options for senior citizens. Lev Gornick and his team at Case Western Reserve University are developing high-definition, multi-point video conferencing with potential to improve healthcare delivery. This application would enable patients to consult clinicians for diagnosis and treatment without having to leave their homes. In addition, it will help NSF to do peer review using virtual panels in a much better way in the future. <laughs> That's my hope. Another team led by Henry McDonald at the University of Tennessee in Chattanooga is working on a disaster response system that provides first responders with training and planning, as well as with real-time guidance on effective strategies. This application would greatly improve public safety. We've also made several awards that promise, promise to transform advanced manufacturing. One example is George Adams and his team at Purdue. They are developing an open innovation manufacturing network to devise new ways for customers to interact with suppliers. To sustain our momentum, today we are also pleased to announce the publication of a dear colleague letter, which thanks to the internet, will reach tens of thousands of people later this morning. It calls upon the research and education communities to develop applications across all national priorities that take advantage of the next generation networks enabled through Genie technologies. In addition, NSF is also announcing today an award to the Mozilla Foundation to host an open innovation challenge. This contest, called Mozilla Ignite, invites everyone from application designers and developers, university researchers and students, entrepreneurs and visionaries, decorated visionary, visionaries and self-appointed visionaries across the country who are not normally part of the NSF grantee community to brainstorm and build next generation applications in national priority areas. Through US Ignite, students, citizens, and startups will have the same opportunity as researchers and industry leaders to create the next great ideas to improve the lives of Americans everywhere. We are very much looking forward to the innovative ideas and the transformative applications that will result from uh, today's activities. Leveraging earlier NSF investments in Gini will allow innovation on the only open testbed at the national scale. The creation and deployment of previously impossible applications on next generation internets have the potential to transform our, for our lives in ways in which we cannot imagine today. NSF is pleased to be at the center of a potential revolution in ultra high speed networking. We look forward to nurturing this initiative through collaborations with our sister agencies, the higher education community, and industry partners. I would like to close by thanking NSF Susie Iacono, who's sitting right there, for her leadership in US Ignite. I also would like to thank you, Susie. This effort was also made possible through a lot of activities from my colleagues in Computer and Information Science and Engineering Directorate, as well as the Engineering Directorate. And I would like to thank the leadership of those two directorates, uh, Farnam Jahanian, who's here, and Tom Peterson, uh, for their leadership uh, in bringing this together. Uh, John mentioned about um, Tom Khalil, and I've had the great pleasure of interacting very closely with Tom. And um, I would like to add one more thing to what uh, Dr. Holdren said. 
Um, every time I go to have dinner with Tom, I go with the intention of relaxing after a meal, but I always come back with a lot of new ideas that increases my workload after every, every encounter. But I want to congratulate Tom for this uh, phenomenal achievement and for all your leadership, and also Nick Mannard uh, for, for your leadership. Let me now introduce to you our next speaker, Dr. John Underkoffler, the co-founder of Oblong Industries. This new tech startup is an example of the kind of innovative entrepreneurship that this initiative will support. John is the inventor of G-Speak. It's a gestural interface system that was the inspiration for the system that Tom Cruise manipulates in Minority Report. Whizzing through video clips of future crimes while hovering in midair. Let's welcome Dr. John Unterkoffler. Thank you, Dr. Suresh. Well, I'm here today because US Ignite seeks, among other things, to accelerate the transition of innovative ideas from labs, startups, students, and others out into the market. Oblong Industries is a technology company based in Los Angeles uh, with additional offices in Boston and Barcelona. But as a company, we exist with a single simple purpose, which is namely to fundamentally change the way all human beings use computers. Oblong's work and ideas are well known in part through the movie Minority Report, for which we designed the gestural technology sequences uh, that were featured in scenes of forensic analysis that take place in a fictional Washington, D.C. set in a future 2054. But we based those scenes on a decade of earlier research, uh, real-world functioning prototypes that we'd spent much of the 1990s building at the MIT Media Lab. And of course, Oblong integrates ideas brought in the form of people uh, from labs in places like Georgia Tech, LSU, the Rhode Island School of Design, Harvey Mudd, Caltech, UCLA, and, and a dozen others. So we are really uh, born of the lab, I suppose. But this is the most exciting moment in the life of all these ideas and all this work because we're actually making the Minority Report technology available in a commercial context. The stuff is real and it works today, now, uh, arguably 40 years ahead of schedule, and it works far better even than the movie dared imagine. It's a, it's a leap forward of a sort of generational magnitude in what it means to work, communicate, and collaborate through a digital medium, and it comes as I think it must in the form of a radically new user interface, uh, an HMI, a human machine interface, uh, that operates across a new kind of high-level networking and messaging protocol. Oblong believes that uh, as a species, we've owed ourselves this kind of improvement for quite some time now. Uh, I think if it's possible, maybe the next best thing is to roll the video. Just a brief look at the kind of work that we build. And we're already rolling here, great. Uh, so you see that uh, G-Speak Systems, Oblong's technology, allows for the large-scale manipulation of data for images and objects and uh, applications and data to move across screens and between devices for the navigation around massive-scale data sets. And it is fundamentally, as a basic proposition, uh, a spatial, a gestural interface. We privilege human hands, those uh, exquisite instruments that we're all given uh, and that are not made much of in traditional interfaces. And space is a critical concept as well because by binding together room space, human space, architectural space, and data spaces, um, you, you sort of close the loop. This is the mezzanine system. It's a kind of distillation of all the ideas uh, that Oblong has put together. And it's a collaboration environment that allows anyone with any device and a collection of heterogeneous devices to work together in a shared pixel workspace. So here you see a pad computing device being used as a control surface. Earlier we saw a small phone uh, injecting data into the scene. There's a remote participant who's got immediate and instantaneous access to the same stuff uh, from both a data injection and control point of view. Telepresence is automatically and seamlessly integrated. Uh, and you just plug in a laptop or a number of laptops or desktop machines and you can import those pixel streams and those applications directly into the work environment. And through a thin uh, stream of control that goes back upstream, anyone in the room or any remote participant can also use those applications. So there's a kind of syndication of, uh, of capabilities that's afforded by systems like this. 
Uh, today, we at Oblong work with companies like Boeing and GE, often at the intersection of big data and collaboration, helping them in areas like energy, aerospace, and logistics. We also work with universities and other research entities across the nation. And our mezzanine systems are bringing a new kind of collaborative work, design, productivity, and decision making to everything from large enterprise to small businesses. Now, the importance of broadband networks to such efforts can't be overstated. We've designed our software and hardware platforms to anticipate the kind of high capacity networks that US Ignite is bringing a community together around. A new UI that makes distributed collaboration possible across vast distances only makes sense in the presence of high speed, low latency, and software definable traffic lanes where there's intelligence in the network itself. And Ignite recognizes that next generation networking represents not just a quantitative shift, if it just meant that you could download movies faster, that would be convenient, but not really interesting. Uh, much more crucially, it's a qualitative shift. New kinds of application, new kinds of work, and as a natural corollary, new jobs. To really pull the whole thing off requires development, not just in a single group or company, but across an ecosystem, a cooperative mesh of commercial entities, nonprofits, universities, government agencies, and domain-specific research centers. And this, to me, is the most important thing that Ignite represents, an opportunity, a mechanism, a medium through which these critical efforts can be encouraged, coordinated, and cross-pollinated. It's not about the raw technology. It's about the people who shape that technology for human use and human benefit. Oblong looks forward to working with the US Ignite partnership across research and university communities, commercial and nonprofit communities, and government and regional communities all. Thanks for that. And now I would like to introduce Julius Janikowski, chairman of the Federal Com Communications Commission. Julius has been serving in that role since 2009, and it was during his tenure that the FCC developed the ambitious National Broadband Plan, a strategy to harness the opportunities of high-speed internet, promote US global competitiveness, and bring the benefits of 21st century communications to all Americans. Please welcome Chairman Janikowski. Thank you, uh, John Undercuffler, for that uh, wonderful and impossible to follow presentation. Uh, Dr. Suresh, thank you. Dr. Holdren, thank you for organizing this to you uh, and your team, Nick Maynard and Tom Khalil and Tom Power. You're doing great things at OSTP, and we're seeing today uh, some tangible deliverables, uh, and that's just fantastic. Uh, uh, of course, thank you to President uh, Obama for his vision and leadership as reflected in today's announcements, the executive order, uh, and U.S. Uh, Ignite. This is a big deal. As the President has said repeatedly, the U.S. has led the world economically because we have led the world in innovation. In the 21st century, broadband, wired and wireless, is our innovation infrastructure. Broadband is reshaping our economy and our lives more profoundly than any technology since electricity. And broadband has enormous potential to help advance national goals around education, energy, public safety, uh, health care. Uh, I'm glad to see so many people here today who are working around the clock to drive an exciting broadband future. I'll mention a couple uh, uh, because these are some of the folks we've engaged with most at the FCC. I know I'm going to leave people out, uh, but I do want to acknowledge Todd Park, uh, who uh, did such great work at HHS, uh, harnessing technology for medicine and healthcare, now as U.S. CTO, uh, operating on a broadband, broad, uh, broader platform. Uh, Larry Strickling, my colleague, uh, Assistant Secretary at NTIA, uh, under his leadership, uh, we've seen the implementation of uh, a very important Recovery Act broadband program uh, that's delivering real benefits in communities across America. Uh, we have uh, the private sector represented uh, here, uh, John Donovan from AT&T, who's been engaged with our processes. AT&T, uh, not that long ago, announced a, a new $50 million uh, broadband investment in rural Mississippi, in part because of the FCC's universal service reforms. That's just a start. I know uh, AT&T has announced it's looking at much larger investments in rural America, and that's a good thing. Mark Ganzi uh, is here, who has been a, a constant source of practical ideas on driving uh, the acceleration of broadband build-out. Tom Wheeler uh, is here, uh, uh, an investor and the head of our Technology Advisory Committee. I'll come back to that. 
Uh, we have people here representing new uh, outside the government initiatives like uh, Gig U. Uh, Blair Levin uh, is here, who is the leader of our national broadband plan effort, which was just mentioned uh, a few minutes ago. Uh, this is an exciting time in the world of broadband. So many great things are happening and have happened in the last three years. Uh, for example, we have now regained global leadership in mobile. Our mobile apps economy, uh, which didn't exist just a few years ago, is the envy of the world. Uh, other countries that we have looked at in the past, Japan, South Korea, where we used to say, oh, why they're doing all these things on, uh, uh, on their mobile devices. Well, today they're using American operating systems, American apps. Uh, 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 we are going to be the first country in the world to scale at 4G, the next generation of wireless broadband. Uh, we're, we already have today 64% of the world's 4G LTE subscribers. Uh, uh, this is going to make, it already is making the U.S. the world's testbed for next generation mobile broadband innovations. On the wired side, very good news, very good progress. Three years ago, only 20% of Americans lived in areas with infrastructure that was capable of more than 20 megabits per second. Today, that 20% is up to 80%. That's real progress. Private investment, innovation, job creation, all up in the broadband economy, moving in the right direction. But of course, there's no rest for the weary. There's still a lot of work to do, many challenges uh, ahead. We need to uh, tackle the growing demand for spectrum by freeing up more spectrum and driving greater spectrum efficiency. We need to increase our broadband adoption rate. Uh, we need to move forward on connecting all Americans wherever they are to broadband. And we need to drive greater and greater speeds and capacity uh, in and around broadband. We need to have test beds all over the country delivering super high broadband so innovators like Oblong and many others uh, have places to not just think about what the next uh, decade or two or three will look like, uh, but build it, roll it out, demonstrate the benefits, and have it drive new demand, new investment, new jobs. Uh, uh, now, uh, no easy task to get there either. Um, we need to do so because a mindset of abundance when it comes to broadband will drive innovation of a sort that we can't even imagine as it has in the past. Now, a key part of the plan to meet these goals is to remove barriers to broadband build out, to accelerate the building of faster and faster networks to drive private investment and critically to, incent to, to, incur to get more bang for the broadband investment buck. Uh, it's one of our highest priorities at the FCC. Uh, it's why the National Broadband Plan uh, talked about dig once. It's why it talked about the opportunities to move forward uh, on federal properties. Uh, it's why uh, we adopted a shot clock to speed up tow uh, tower siting uh, and antennas for rolling out our mobile infrastructure faster and more efficiently. It's why we address something at the FCC called pole attachments, making it easier for companies to string uh, fiber to consumers and businesses. I, your eyes are glazing over and I understand that, but these are the kinds of blood and guts initiatives that we need to pursue if we're going to encourage the kind of dramatic private investment we need to meet our broadband goals in the United States. It's also why at the FCC we set up uh, a group that we call our TAC, our Technology Advisory Council. Tom Wheeler uh, is here uh, who runs that. Uh, I challenged our TAC to develop a set of practical, implementable ideas that could move the needle on broadband. And one of their recommendations, building on an idea in the National Broadband Plan, was exactly what we're seeing today. 
uh, an executive order directing the federal agencies to move forward on dig ones, to move forward on lowering barriers on federal lands. Uh, uh, Tom, it's a tribute to you and the work of your colleagues on, uh, on, on TAC and teaming up with OSTP uh, and others to get this done. Uh, this will make a material difference. It will lower the cost of investment. It will foster uh, job creation. It will fuel economic uh, growth. It will help bring the future closer. Uh, it's also an example of how uh, smart government reform can relate to driving private investment. Uh, this is simply a matter of looking at the current rules uh, around federal properties, around construction, and saying, hey, let's make this better to drive uh, our national broadband policies. Uh, now, removing barriers is a critical part of what we need to do, but of course it's not the only thing we need to do. We need to be proactive uh, in government in encouraging initiatives that accelerate the broadband future that we heard described earlier. Uh, there are lots of different ways that we can build public-private partnerships that will make a difference. Uh, one of the initiatives we put together at the FCC is something called Connect to Compete, uh, which will deliver low-cost broadband to families with kids on school lunch programs, the first time the U.S. has done this. Uh, and I thank the companies that have stepped, stepped up, particularly the cable industry, uh, to deliver those benefits. What we're seeing in U.S. Ignite, this incredibly exciting new public-private partnership, uh, is more of this wonderful objective to think about the creative ways that we can bring together the National Science Foundation, other agencies of government with innovators in the private sector to move the ball forward. Uh, U.S. Ignite uh, is a complement to Connect to Compete. It's a uh, complement to Gig U, uh, the effort uh, to drive ultra high speed test beds at uh, college campuses around the country. Uh, these things together and more uh, 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 will um, bring us uh, an incredible world of innovation uh, and drive U.S. leadership and innovation in the 21st century uh, as we uh, have led the world in the, tw in the 20th. Uh, so I'm pleased to be here uh, as part of these uh, announcements. Uh, I congratulate everyone involved uh, in this, uh, and a lot of people have a lot to be proud of. Uh, one of the areas in our country where there's a lot to be proud of and which proves out some of these ideas uh, is the city of Chattanooga, Tennessee. Uh, and uh, what I'm going to do now is uh, turn your attention to the video screen uh, where we're going to see a little bit about what's going on in Chattanooga uh, where there is incredible work being done to revolutionize the city's we're economy, to do create new to jobs, actually and start create the future today. Cleveland, Ohio is experiencing... In 2010, Chattanooga, Tennessee became America's first gig city when it launched a pioneering effort to answer the question, what will happen when America breaks the bandwidth barrier? As a result of Chattanooga's investments, the city has attracted companies like Volkswagen, Alstom, and Amazon Fulfillment Services to create more than 7,000 new jobs and spur dozens of new small and medium-sized businesses. Launched and managed by Chattanooga's municipally owned utility, EPB, the Gig Network is a community-wide fiber optic system capable of delivering up to 1,000 megabits per second and advanced networking capabilities to more than 150,000 homes and businesses in its 600 square mile service area. Once the network was in place, we began to see results almost immediately. Using the fiber optic network as the foundation for a super fast wireless mesh, the City of Chattanooga launched public service enhancements, ranging from smarter traffic signals and broadband-enabled police cruisers to a system for delivering building schematics to firefighters en route to an emergency. Just as important, we invited local entrepreneurs to use the network as a means for job creation and innovation. Chattanooga-based Global Green Lighting took the mesh network as inspiration for pairing its energy-efficient outdoor lighting solutions with real-time metering and internet-based controls. We have decided that we're not going to be manufacturing this product in China, but we're actually going to be moving the jobs back to Chattanooga and be producing the lights here in Chattanooga. 
The advanced network was also a deciding factor in attracting new companies like HomeServe USA, which created 140 new jobs when it established a facility in Chattanooga. The company now plans to hire 120 more people by the end of the year. Claris Networks, a cloud computing company, is moving most of its technical operations to Chattanooga. The operating environment that Chattanooga allows us to, uh, to play in uh, gives us an opportunity to grow our business exponentially. Uh, we plan on tripling our workforce of higher paid engineers in this market in uh, 18 to 24 months. Now, Chattanooga is launching the Gig Tank in partnership with US Ignite and a host of leading edge technology companies to pioneer applications for gig internet speeds. You know, a hundred years ago, there were cities that were just getting electricity, and all they knew, knew to do with it was streetlights. Well, obviously, we're using electricity for a lot more than just streetlights nowadays. Similar situation in Chattanooga. We have this amazing bandwidth capacity here, and Chattanooga, as the first city with this, this internet speed, is going to be the place where people come and figure out what's next. Chattanooga is giving enterprising entrepreneurs a two to three year head start in defining the next generation of e-commerce. Pioneering communities like Chattanooga are already on board. Join us in igniting the United States with amazing new applications for next generation networks. Well, I think Chattanooga is setting a great example for the rest of the country. I don't know if anyone's here, but it's... So, I am uh, Larry Strickling, uh, the Assistant Secretary of Commerce and the Administrator of the National Telecommunications and Information Administration. And I'm uh, quite pleased to be here at the launch of U.S. Ignite, uh, an exciting and important new public-private partnership dedicated to designing and deploying next generation broadband applications. NTIA, for those of you who may not be that familiar with our agency, is the principal advisor to the President on communications and information policy. And at the beginning of this administration, Congress provided us $4 billion through the Recovery Act to improve broadband access and availability in unserved and underserved areas of the country, as well as to anchor institutions such as the universities and institutions that are signing up to participate in U.S. Ignite. For U.S. Ignite to succeed, its members are going to need access to a robust state-of-the-art infrastructure on which to build their innovative applications. As Chairman Jenikowski discussed, Industry is providing much of this investment, and through the chairman's leadership, industry is going to have more opportunities to make the types of investments that are needed to support the U.S. Ignite partners. Our program focuses on those areas of the country where market forces have not been delivering the level of broadband investment necessary to support these very high-speed applications. And so we chose early on to focus our grant dollars on expanding middle-mile capacity in underserved areas as well as to build out to anchor institutions whose speed requirements we know are substantially greater than those of most consumers. And through our projects, many more communities will have access to broadband speeds of one gigabit or more. For example, take Merit Networks, which operates primarily in the state of Michigan. Merit is one of the U.S. Ignite partners, and Don Welch, its president and CEO, is here today for the event. Um, and prior to our grant program, Merit provided one gigabit service to 30 of Michigan's 83 counties. We awarded Recovery Act grants totaling almost $103 million to Merit, and that's allowing the organization to extend one gigabit service to 77 of Michigan counties, an increase of nearly 60%. And upon conclusion of our two projects, nearly every county in Michigan will have access to the very high-speed broadband to enable the applications that U.S. Ignite envisions to be successful. Overall, our projects are delivering benefits across the country. Already, our grantees have deployed more than 56,000 miles of new or upgraded networks and have connected more than 8,000 community anchor institutions to broadband service. And our program is not just limited to broadband availability. We also have provided grants totaling $200 million to build or expand public computer centers across the country, and our grantees have used those funds to install more than 30,000 workstations in these centers. 
Congress also directed us to provide $250 million in grants for sustainable broadband adoption. As Chairman Jenikowski mentioned, and as we know from our research that we've done in tandem with the Census Bureau, only about 68% of households subscribe to broadband even service, even though it is available to a much larger percentage of the population. Congress wanted us to explore different strategies to encourage people to sign up for broadband service. And so our adoption projects, combined with our public computer center grants, have provided more than 7 million hours of technology training to about 2 million users and have generated approximately 350,000 new broadband internet subscribers. So I'm pleased to announce today that several, several of our grantees have already signed up to participate in the US Ignite effort. I already mentioned Merit Networks in Michigan, but in addition to Ta Don and his team, we have here to, uh, other participants from our grant program who will be participating in US Ignite, including Urbana-Champaign Big Broadband in Illinois, One Community in Ohio, whose CEO Scott Rourke is here today, uh, Utah Education Network in Utopia in Utah, Senec in California, and here locally, DCNet and Internet2. These Recovery Act funded networks are perfect test beds for the next generation US Ignite applications. So for example, the big broadband project in Illinois connects the National Petascale Computing Facility, the fastest research supercomputer in the world. And researchers at that facility will work with the local community and US Ignite partners to develop applications in critical areas such as cloud computing, advanced manufacturing, health, and education. One community as a regional network in northeastern Ohio, and it has worked closely with local universities such as Case Western to deliver a new set of services and programs such as the surgery simulation application we'll be seeing a few minutes from now. In closing, we're very happy that many of our broadband network investments will further enable this important initiative, and we look forward to what the future and U.S. Ignite will have to offer. Now it is my pleasure to introduce the engine of creativity, Tom Khalil, uh, Deputy Director of Policy at the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy. And of course, in addition to his role at OSTP, Tom is also Senior Advisor to the National Economic Council, acting as point person on a wide range of their technology issues. So please welcome Tom Khalil. Thank you for that introduction. My father would have been proud and my mother would have believed it. So, uh, and I also, I also want to thank you for, uh, Larry, your incredible leadership on, on broadband and, and telecommunications policy for the administration. Um, and uh, as, as Dr. Holdren noted earlier, the president believes that uh, creating the internet of the future uh, has to be an all hands on deck effort that brings together the federal agencies, the leaders in the private sector, uh, universities, foundations, nonprofits, independent developers, and others. And that's why I'm delighted to announce uh, a, a number of ad additional key steps that the administration is announcing today to support US Ignite. The Department of, of Health and Homeland Services uh, Beacon community that Todd Park played such an important role in, in getting off the ground and the, uh, uh, the Office of the uh, National Coordinator for Health IT uh, will help the Mayo Clinic uh, team up with US Ignite to develop new healthcare applications such as remote surgical theater and patient monitoring. The Department of Energy will be working with US Ignite and Mozilla to develop next generation workforce development in areas like weatherization and the inst installation of solar panels. The department estimates that this training could reduce the cost of solar panel installation by several hundred dollars per job. So th that's a, a type of impact that these types of next generation applications can have. The Department of Defense uh, is connecting military families on base with U new US Ignite services while creating new research opportunities to students at West Point. For example, cadets at West Point are collaborating with soldiers in Afghanistan to develop new algorithms uh, to detect uh, improvised explosive de devices and, and save the lives of American soldiers. The Department of Agriculture, which has played such an important role in uh, accelerating the deployment of broadband in rural communities, will connect US Ignite with telecom carriers that it invests in uh, and assist in developing applications in areas such as public safety. 
And the Institute for Museum and Library Services will partner with US Ignite and the Digital Public Library Program to create new applications for library uh, patrons. Uh, we think that libraries will now allow US Ignite to quickly expand its national reach, uh, giving access to next generation applications to thousands of individuals in, in communities that lack high speed broadband today. We have a great list of private sector, nonprofit, and foundation partners uh, at, as well that are described in our 14 page fact sheet. There's going to be a quiz later on, so I would encourage you all to read it. Um, uh, for those of you who are trying to figure out how you might get involved in U US Ignite, if you haven't decided to do that, one area that I think is particularly important is the role of students in, in fostering innovation. If we look at the history of the internet, uh, whether it was Mark Andreessen uh, developing the first uh, graphical web browser at the National Center for Supercomputing Applications or uh, as uh, Dr. Holdren mentioned, uh, the, the role that students played in the development of Google. So I think there's a really critical role that we could play in empowering uh, students to develop the next generation of applications uh, by bringing gigabit speeds and, and next generation networks uh, to the dorm room. So uh, now it's my pleasure to introduce someone who's played an absolutely critical role in getting this effort off the ground. Sue Spradley, the current executive director of US Ignite. Prior to her work with US Ignite, Sue headed up North American operations for Nokia Siemens Networks has brought instant credibility to this effort and industry. She's often touted as uh, one of the top women in wireless uh, by the media. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Sue Spradley. This was a big day for me. Uh, whoosh, we made it, Nick. Uh, US Ignite is, in fact, about igniting next generation applications to bring leadership back to North America. And what we saw earlier in the Chattanooga demo video is exactly what we've seen from two dozen other communities. It's a real impact on creating applications, opportunities, and jobs for cities and carriers that have already invested in the advanced networks. You saw Chattanooga's ability to build a growing group of startups, expand employment in their current businesses, and attract global leaders like Amazon to their city. Chattanooga has, working with US Ignite, launched an application development program called Gig Tank, and it's really the next step in their journey as Gig City. In Lafayette, they've gotten so excited about US Ignite that they are announcing today a healthcare living lab focused on bringing leading edge applications, jobs, and better health to the citizens of Lafayette Parish and the rest of the United States. This lab will be a cornerstone of the type of applications that US Ignite will bring forward. In a moment, you're gonna see a demonstration of a really, there's no other way to say it, cool, next gen application. And I think one of the things you'll start to think is, why, why haven't we been doing that for a really long time? The US Ignite partnership was created to repeat successes like these over and over across the country. It is only through the cooperation of community, industry, and university stakeholders that we can facilitate the development of applications that have a national impact on how people live and work. So what is US Ignite? We are a nonprofit, a convener, and a clearinghouse for resources and best practices. Our mission is to connect and amplify efforts across the entire country with a goal of 60 transformative applications in, in 200 communities in the next three to five years. And I, I think maybe coming from the private sector, having a goal that we can measure ourselves by is, is extremely important. But this is really just a bunch of talk. So here's how we're gonna get this done. First, we have an extraordinary team with a broad range of industry, academic, and nonprofit experience gathered together. We have incredible partners, companies who are founding us, such as Juniper and NEC, as well as Cisco, Verizon, and Comcast, foundations like the Mott Foundation, and communities like one community in Cleveland that we talked about, and others highlighted today, and our partners, Mozilla and Internet2. Just for your reference, there's a map of all 30 of our founding partners and community, communities, pardon me, attached to our press package that you saw up front, and we also have a nifty little US Ignite 
drive that you can take with you. And what's cool about it is it does show the applications which we are talking about today. So I think I'll kind of help you continue to think through what we're talking about. So what are our goals quickly? Our goals are accelerate the development and adoption of compelling next generation network applications. Applications not possible today, providing public benefit in national priority areas of healthcare, education, workforce development, clean energy, transportation, public safety, and advanced manufacturing. Provide a forum for coordination and best practice sharing among our participants. As you heard from Dr. Suresh earlier, the Genie program and our partners, Innovative Lab Development Labs, provide the basis for these applications and advances in te technology. Pardon me. Next generation applications will leverage software-defined networks to provide capabilities not possible today. And we will cover a little bit more about the technology for those of you who have an interest in one of the breakout sessions after, which I'll talk about at the very end of the session today. We will also provide a test bed for demonstrating the applications by coordinating and encouraging the deployment of advanced network infrastructure in cities, communities, and among community anchor institutions. Today's announcement, for example, by Verizon of their 300 megabit U.S. test bed in Philadelphia is really a perfect example of the leadership the industry is bringing to this effort. Thank you, Kathy. Test beds such as this one and others being announced today will allow for faster adoption of successful applications nationwide. So what do I need you to do? If you're a company, a community network, or research and education network, we need you to join if you have not done so already, and we need you to spread the good word so that others join you as Ignite. If you're a student, as Tom mentioned, a startup or developer, we need you to work on our application challenges at the national and regional levels, which we'll be working with Mozilla Ignite, that we talked about earlier, to get those started, as well as some of our communities. And if you're a nonprofit, a foundation, or a city, we need you to come together with us to create a new vision and strategy to get a return on your investment on your broadband network and drive forth the capabilities that US Ignite has assembled to adjust your challenges. We encourage everyone in the room to share our successes as we set out on this journey to make sure that America leads the way in how we work and live. I now have the pleasure to introduce Mr. John Donovan, <laughs> Senior Executive President of at and Technology and Network Operations. Under John's leadership, AT&T has expanded its innovation programs in a very big way and is now as recognized an industry leader in working with application developers and others to make AT&T Network open to collaboration and innovation. Please welcome my friend and a uh, great industry leader, John Donovan. Thank you. It's great to be here. These, uh, this is an august group of uh, technology leaders and, in fact, a lot of the ecosystem that we deal with every day. So it's uh, thrilling to be here amongst the industry luminaries and nice to be introduced by a friend. Thank you very much, Sue. Um, these bold initiatives are great. You, you have to remember that um, we put a man on the moon before we put wheels on a suitcase. Um, and sometimes <laughs> extraordinary things occur when you, you think big early. Um, <laughs> I'm excited to be here today to renew AT&T's commitment to U.S. Ignite and our joint efforts to extend the magic of broadband. I also want to point to today's executive order as a significant move in helping us realize the goal of bringing broadband to all Americans. Everybody in this room understands how broadband has changed our world, opening new avenues in education, improving health care, enhancing energy efficiency, and expanding the horizons of every American who has access to that broadband. It's also about creating new economic opportunity, generating jobs, paving new paths for commerce, and even stimulating the birth of whole new industries and service categories. AT&T is proud to be part of U.S. Ignite and to continue our work with Genie-based university research projects. This initiative exemplifies the tradition of AT&T, not just in AT&T Labs, which has been a technology pioneer since its first day in 1901 through today, when our labs employs 1,200 of the world's best scientists and engineers. But innovation has to be a way of life, not just throughout AT&T, but through every sector of our country. And that is why we are happy to lend our support to US Ignite. 
The innovation targeted by U.S. Ignite speaks not only to our imagination, but also exemplifies how government and private industry can work together. That partnership between the government and the private sector is essential for overcoming the remaining barriers to universal broadband and the extension of advanced wireless service across America. In the wireless space especially, where consumer demand is growing at a breathtaking pace, we collectively face a host of challenges in meeting deployment goals. Americans have fallen in love with mobile technology. In the last five years, the demand for mobile data has grown by 20,000 percent. Over the next five years, we expect 75 percent additional mobile data growth each and every year. It's not just about the personal devices we carry. Almost every day, we're discovering new ways to use wireless connections to enrich Americans' lives. Wireless applications enable us to improve health outcomes through remote monitoring. GPS devices help us find our way in strange cities. Machine-to-machine -machine links enable us to adjust energy usage to better match supply and demand. Digital homes, connected cars, and mobile wallets are just some of the ideas that lie ahead. The President's executive order exemplifies one way government can help with the challenge of deployment, which is essential for these benefits to be realized broadly. The executive order opens federal facilities to help the government create the conditions that enable the private sector to invest in and deploy broadband. This is the type of practical, no-nonsense action that advances the day-to-day -day work of delivering broadband. The Dig Wants Directive to the Department of Transportation is another piece of smart government that should speed deployment and cut costs. The President has often said that government must create the conditions that enable the private sector to invest in America. That's what this executive order does. And of course, as both Chairman Janikowski and the President have observed on many occasions, we need more spectrum. We salute their efforts toward that goal, and we hope they can lead the government to move even faster into this area. I like to think we can all agree that getting to the spectrum we need requires us to take advantage of every available option with our minimum of red tape and delay so that our country continues to lead the world in wireless services, as Chairman Janikowski just said. If we fall short on spectrum, we also fall short on our national goals for broadband. Working together, I am confident we can get the job done. U.S. Ignite and the executive order demonstrate what's possible when government and private industry are able to team up. With smart government policy approaches like those we are recognizing here today, I am confident that AT&T and other private companies will continue to invest in broadband so that we can reach our common goals for America. It's my pleasure to introduce our next speaker, Mark Ganzi, the Chief Executive Officer of Global Tower Partners. GTP is the largest privately owned tower operator in the U.S. He is also serving his second term as the Chairman of the Personal Communications Industry Association. Please welcome Mark. Well, uh, first of all, I'm, I'm incredibly humbled uh, to be here and uh, to be in this room. A um, bit of a homecoming for me. I was actually an intern here, so uh, having some, some old memories of the OEB. But um, first of all, I want to thank the leadership of Chairman Janikowski and President Obama. Um, we are in remarkable, remarkable times today. And without that leadership and without making broadband available, making spectrum available, and paving the way to build this infrastructure, we as a country cannot advance. Um, OSTP, U.S. Ignite, uh, my fellow participants that are here, our mantra as a trade association is quite simple. We're working for wireless everywhere. And what does that mean today? It means that our challenge as an industry is to make the pipes and the plumbing work. Um, while it's one thing to put spectrum out there and it's another thing to talk about devices and it's another thing to talk about the speeds and the apps, if we cannot build these networks, if we cannot get the antenna sites, DAS networks, microcells, small cell architecture, if we cannot get the plumbing 
to deliver the promise that this country wants to achieve, uh, we cannot deliver on what the American economy needs, which is being an innovator and being a leader. You know, wireless services and infrastructure is not about bars on a phone anymore. It's about being a gateway to productivity, education, civic participation, as we saw here, public safety, and much more. I applaud the administration. I applaud Congress and the FCC for taking action to streamline new infrastructure deployment. Today's executive order is a step. It's an important step in making government land and government buildings available for the pipes and the plumbing that we talk about as an industry. The Middle Class Tax Relief and Job Creation Act of 2012 is a very, very important piece of legislation to the wireless ecosystem. It's already begun enabling more efficient use of existing infrastructure and enhancing mobile access. And most importantly, making government agencies, local governments, municipalities accountable. If you cannot be accountable and you cannot understand the importance of the shot clock, we can never build sites, we can never build DAS networks, and we can never deploy broadband in our communities today. As the government makes more spectrum available, our industry is upgrading and expanding the nation's wireless networks to ensure that all Americans have access to exciting new services, applications, and to ensure that we can meet the ever-increasing demand for mobile connectivity and capacity. Fully deploying 4G and next generation networks will not only bring many benefits to high-speed broadband to all people in all places, but it will keep the U.S a world leader, and promote a prosperous future for generations to come. A recent Deloitte study found that investing in 4G networks could account for $151 billion in GDP growth. Think about that. As we transition from 3G to 4G, we're talking about $151 billion of investing activities. The same report cited that we can put 500,000 new jobs back into the economy. 500,000 new jobs. Think about those jobs for a second. They're engineering jobs, manufacturing jobs, professional services, construction jobs. These are the types of jobs that we need to move our economy forward. My fellow member companies represent over 250,000 cell sites, 60,000 small cells, hundreds of thousands of DAS nodes, and all of us are focused on one thing, which is trying to deliver faster speeds to your devices, to your home, to your companies, to your employees, and to your consumers. This is not a sexy job, what we do. Uh, we may live in a very sexy industry, but building networks today is difficult. It is not about just building a 200-foot tower in a community it is about having multiple points of access in a network that are interconnected. Small cell architecture, a lot has talked about that. DAS networks where we use pole attachments to put small node antennas to give services to communities where you cannot build towers. Large towers, stealth towers, all of this is part of the ecosystem. If we can't build the ecosystem, we can't deliver the promise. It's really simple. Today's executive order is been a lot of hard work, and there's a lot of people in this room that have put, put a lot of energy into this. I can tell you for years and years, as a, as a CEO of a tower company, and as the chairman of our trade association, getting access to government land has been close to impossible. The ability to clear those barriers, to have a uniform and centralized process of signing leases, is the first step towards the promise of delivering on that infrastructure. Like I said, I'm humbled to be here. We're pleased to be a part of the process. I really applaud our Chairman Janikowski for including our sector and our industry in these discussions. Um, we are confident that in working together, we can achieve the promise of new networks, and I think it's well within our reach, and we appreciate your leadership. Um, now it's my pleasure to introduce a couple of very interesting doctors who I got to talk to earlier. I didn't know much about what they did, but uh, Dr. Warren Selim and Dr. Andrew Sloan. Uh, Dr. Selim is director of the Center for Stroke and, and vice chairman of the Department of Neurosurgery at the University of Hospitals of Cleveland. Dr. Sloan is the chair of Neurosurgical Oncology 
and director of the Brain Tumor and Neuro Oncology Center. That's a long title on a business card. At Case Western Reserve University. Um, they're about to show us some very, very exciting uh, and amazing things they do day to day at the university's uh, hospital system, leveraging next generation technology that saves lives. Please, please join me in welcome Dr. Selman and Dr. Slim. What we're trying to do is to actually create the future today. Cleveland, Ohio is experiencing firsthand what ultra speed networking delivers for businesses and for families. The productivity potential is just huge. Case Western Reserve University is bringing gigabit connectivity to neighborhood homes around campus. There's a proof point in Cleveland and we here at Case Western Reserve University are on the frontier of translating how you can use networks to positively impact people's lives. With novel applications that can be exported around the world, such as improving health and wellness at home, it's now possible through gigabit networking. Can you imagine the ability to connect with the patients in their natural setting where they live? So they're actually picking up cues and high def as if the patients were in the office. One, it's the right thing to do. Two, it's the quality of care. Three, it's billions of dollars of saving for our healthcare system. That's already strained. With ultra-fast connectivity, homeowners can conserve energy by monitoring usage in real time. High-definition video cameras can keep neighborhoods safer. And high school students are experiencing learning like never before through the visionary One Community Broadband Network, using advanced digital capabilities to transform the region and establish Northeast Ohio as a national hub for innovation and economic growth. The Hollands are adjusting to Pitter's cognitive challenges through remote coaching with a geriatric neurologist. It's close to being a necessity uh, for us. The opportunities with gigabit connections can be limitless. With a project called Surgical Theater, Cleveland surgeons are exploring the possibilities of hyper-realistic simulations to determine the very best approach to very complex surgeries. An ability to allow surgeons to practice their surgeries with patient-specific information, all in advance. This is the epitome of a research and development opportunity. It's just setting the surface how much we can do with patients. Next Generation Networking is another way. Cleveland and Case Western Reserve University are thinking beyond the possible. Well, thank you very much. I think you can all see that uh, it's understandable why President Obama wasn't here today, because he is in our fair city, Cleveland, Ohio, experiencing just all that. So I'm disappointed he's not here. I'm grateful he's in Cleveland. I want to thank you all for the opportunity to represent uh, my colleague, Dr. Andrew Sloan, and our colleagues at Surgical Theater. As you saw, Lev sort of gave you a little bit of a glimpse of an introduction about what we'd like to talk about. And that really is the collaboration between a university, a healthcare system, and a startup company called Surgical Theater, all located in Cleveland, Ohio. So Surgical Theater was founded by Israeli Air Force engineers who have spent their time really developing high immersion, high touch technology to help our fighter pilots really envision what they will be doing in the future. The idea was that maybe we could do the same thing as you saw with surgeons, allowing us to practice and really rehearse before we actually enter our operating room theaters. So just as flight simulators use terrain maps obtained before the mission, we can use the same idea by taking the patient-specific data, and that is something that's going to be quite key to remember here, is we're using the same imagery that we use to envision the surgery, but being able to rehearse on that very patient-specific activity before we get into the OR. And using the same tools that we would use in the OR, we're able to again rehearse this. So this is what the surgical rehearsal platform allows us to do. And what I'm going to show here is really what's called the collaborative theater. And that's where the network becomes involved. Because what we're able to do, as you heard my colleague George Cacano talk, and as Lev mentioned, we're able to use that broadband connectivity to allow someone to mentor another perhaps novice or perhaps even their colleague and try to ask for some help on a very difficult technical problem while really being able to see exactly what we're doing. So you're going to see here how we sort of do what we call pre-live the future. And that is 
what we're demonstrating today is one of the most technically challenging neurosurgical operations, and that's clipping a cerebral aneurysm. For many of you who don't know, an aneurysm is like a little blister on a blood vessel, and if that aneurysm ruptures, fewer than one-third of the patients return to their normal lifestyle. So it's a very serious problem. And what we're able to do is take the imagery that we obtain from the preoperative CT scans or MRIs or angiograms, put that together and allow us to be able to manipulate the images in 3D and sort of practice what we would do, rehearse what we would do, essentially the night before, five minutes before, whatever, but at a certain time before surgery. And it's really no different. I mean, if you think Phil Mickelson is not going to go out and practice for, or do the masters without practicing Yo-Yo Ma, the same going to Carnegie Hall. We want that same idea for the surgeon to be able to rehearse the critical parts. Now, getting an experienced surgeon to spend time doing something extra in today's environment, that's not going to be easy to do. But if we can compress it down, allow them to do it anywhere through the broadband connectivity, then I think you'll find very early adoption. So here Dr. Sloan is practicing what we're about to talk about. The large ball that you see sort of in the middle of that screen is the aneurysm, and he's holding a clip applier and applying the clip to the aneurysm that's now turning green. You can see the aneurysm closing. As you see, we actually have actual feedback. The surgeon can feel and see exactly what would be happening at the time of surgery. The reason this is so critical is that we temporarily close off the blood supply to the aneurysm. It's no different than imagining you wouldn't try to work on your car while the engine is running. So we have to stop that for a moment. When we stop blood flow to the brain, we risk a stroke. So we need to be able to choose very quickly what clips we're going to use and how we're going to apply them. Again, if you imagine and you can see the aneurysm, this is the model that you see, but when we take the actual live image through the operating microscope, every time the heart beats, you can see the blood swirl in that aneurysm. It's really a gossamer thin membrane that separates success from failure. And so to be able to apply that without hurting it is really the goal of practicing. And so the mentor can guide uh, the student in how they would like to actually approach the optimal clipping of that aneurysm, changing things as you can see the skull on the left side. Slight variations in head movement or slight variations in position are really the difference between success and failure in this operation. So what you're seeing on the main screen is what the surgeon would be rehearsing, but what you can see on a smaller screen is that the mentee can actually see, well, let me see, if I do it just that way, I'll be able to understand a better way to do that. So we're really now able to transfer knowledge. I don't know if you realize, but uh, essentially since Halstead invented surgical training in this country over 100 years ago, things haven't changed much. It's really see one, do one, teach one. And I'll leave it to your imagination. You don't want to be that patient on the table where they're going through that scenario. So here we have the opportunity to practice outside the operating room. We're able to take the, really the experience and the training that we have communicate it through broadband connectivity and actually rehearse it. And another great thing you can see is that we can rotate the image to see essentially on the dark side of the moon. While I'm applying that clip, I usually can't see behind the aneurysm. But here you can see that we're able to look behind the aneurysm, a view that's simply not available in surgery, say, well, you know what, now I can see that clip does fit perfectly and so I can make the right choice ahead of time. Obviously, that would help reduce medical errors and improve outcome, all of which we're trying to do. So if you can see, we're also going to be able to show you that I can see it sometimes I might be able to say, you know, I don't like that bayoneted clip, and what I'd rather do is try to choose really a clip that's a different one. And there's literally hundreds of them to choose from. So I can scroll through my library of clips and say, in fact, that curve clip is going to look a little bit better than the bayoneted clip. And so again, the opportunity to rehearse these decisions well before I reach the time of the operating room. And so recently, we also took surgical theater one step further and have really tried to incorporate this directly into the OR. And it was very nice to see that Tom Cruise got to practice this first. But one thing that I like to do is really be able to review that same 3D anatomy right when I'm looking into the microscope. And so with a heads-up display in motion sensing, we can actually manipulate images by simply turning just as you saw before, rotating that and saying, I can do that right at the time of surgery to give me that extra advantage of knowing that I'm putting the clip in the proper position again, reducing medical error, decreasing operative time with all the goal of improving outcome. 
So we're planning to utilize this collaborative surgical theater in a way that'll allow us to communicate across the universities, many of you whom you saw mentioned. One of my partners, Neil Martin, is at UCLA, and we're gonna actually try to communicate with each other and rehearse these same type of surgeries, both on patients that we know we're going to treat and see if we can exchange best practices, but also allow us to provide mentorship to our residents and students in a way that never before was possible without being able to work across this super broadband network. So really, two surgeons can sort of step into this collaborative theater and work together on a virtual environment, and they'll be able to do just as the pilots do. They'll be able to pre-live the future. And as Matthew Syed said in his book on uh, the science of success bounce, he said that purposeful practice is the only thing that separates the rest from the best. And so really what we're trying to do is be sure that we can all be the best we can be by doing that purposeful practice. And I believe that the surgical theater and the collaborative network afforded by the high broadband connectivity will allow us to do just that. So I thank you for your attention. Morning. Uh, I'm Stephen Levy, a senior writer at Wired Magazine. Uh, when I was invited to uh, come and moderate this panel, I was a little intimidated because there's such an august uh, gathering here, but I figured, well, it's not like brain surgery, but I guess it is <laughs> sort of like surgery. <laughs> um, so uh, we have some uh, fantastic experts here who can dig into some of the things that you've heard earlier today. Uh, and at the end of the discussion, there is going to be an opportunity uh, to ask a question or two, not only from the auditorium, but from those following on the live webcast. Uh, and for those doing that, or even those in the auditorium who are shy, use the Twitter hashtag USIgnite to send questions, and I'll, I'll get it uh, on my laptop here. Um, but first, let me introduce the panel. I'm going to give relatively brief uh, introductions because you have uh, all the uh, uh, large bios in, in your packet there. Uh, Catherine Brown is Senior Vice President of Public Policy Development and Corporate Responsibility for the Verizon Corporation and is responsible for Verizon's strategic alliances with key national and international organizations. She was once uh, Chief of Staff of, of the FCC. Uh, Chip Elliott is the Principal Investigator and Project Director, Director on the Genie Project, which has been mentioned here, and also Chief Technical Officer for BBN Technologies. Um, and Chip uh, has been uh, researching things like uh, uh, quantum cryptography networks, superconducting single photon, de photo photon detectors, and quantum protocols and algorithms. We don't have time for a demo. Uh, Mark Sermon <laughs> is the executive director of the Mozilla Foundation, a uh, longtime community activist, and we're going to hear about something fascinating uh, that was also mentioned. Uh, that's going on Mozilla. And last but certainly not least, Deborah Estrin is a professor of computer science at UCLA, holding the John Postel Chair in Computer Networks, uh, and is the founding director of the NSF funded Center for Embedded Networking, Network Sensing, a field she helped pioneer. Uh, please welcome our panel. Okay, actually, I'm going to start with Chip. Because uh, uh, we've heard about uh, Jeannie, uh, and he's the project director here. And uh, maybe Chip can help unpack what is the relationship between Jeannie and what Jeannie is and the larger initiative we've been talking about this morning. Okay, well, thank you. Uh, Jeannie is research infrastructure uh, that supports at scale experimentation in future networks, applications, services, uh, and security. It's funded by the National Science Foundation, and it has uh, currently engaged about 60 uh, campus institutions and about 300 uh, researchers uh, so far. Uh, the goal of Genie is to kind of open up campus infrastructure so that you can run interesting new kinds of applications and experiments in parallel with today's internet. So we're building out Genie uh, through a range of uh, U.S. academic campuses with the goal of having uh, the students, the faculty, and the staff uh, in those uh, universities be able to what we call live in the future. Uh, they will be able to, of course, continue to use today's internet, 
Uh, but the analogy I like to use is uh, the Internet will be channel one, but channel two uh, will be some interesting new application uh, that may or may not be compatible with today's Internet. And channel three will be a different such application and so on. Um, it's a very natural match in my mind uh, of infrastructure, which is what Genie is helping to develop, with applications, which is what the US Ignite effort is attempting to develop. Um, we're delighted that uh, cities are entering this mix. I think that makes it very, very interesting. In addition, a number of technologies have started to come out of the Genie project. For example, software-defined networks, uh, which Stanford has created. Those, I think, may have a great deal of influence over these new uh, build-outs uh, that happen across the U.S. Great, thanks. Um, Kathy, um, you're with Verizon. What's involved? Um, I know that you're going to be offering 300 uh, megabits to, to Philadelphia for something that's in, in, uh, in, in this program here. What's involved in that? And you know, uh, when, when Verizon t expands its network to get to that higher speed? Thank you, Steve, and uh, I'm delighted to be here. Uh, thank you all for inviting us to, to speak today. As you know, uh, Verizon builds high-speed networks. We have a, a, a global broadband uh, network that is actually is the Internet backbone, together with our colleagues at AT&T and other big uh, providers of um, uh, global services. Here in the United States, you know, we have an LTE network that we're rolling out right now. It will be nationwide wireless network. Uh, by the end of next year, and we've built the fiber to the home network called FIOS. We're in uh, 12 states. We're in the major uh, metropolitan areas uh, along the East Coast. And this uh, Ignite project gave us a unique opportunity to look at our, look at a place that we have built out our fiber network. We're looking at the city of Philadelphia, where there are rich, rich uh, research uh, institutions, uh, universities and hospitals uh, that we thought if we could demonstrate what this fiber to the home network might do, not just for the hospitals, clinics, and universities, but for the users of the high-speed connection in their homes, that that would be a step up to understand the power of these networks. Our network is a GPON architecture, which means that we are able to uh, future-proof this network. We can raise the speeds by changing the electronics. Uh, most people are buying now uh, 15, 25 megabits because they get terrific, terrific uh, FIOS television and because they get high-speed internet connection. But what more can this uh, connection be used for besides fabulous movies? We know it can be used to transform uh, the healthcare industry. We know and we've seen the kind of demonstration you just saw that surgeons are using uh, uh, high, they're already a high technology uh, uh, profession. They are not a high uh, connected profession. They are not connected at home like we are. They are not doing their professional work from their living room. Imagine if that work could be done, as you said, very, very uh, busy uh, surgeons that they could be home in the evening and doing that on their network. Imagine uh, those screens that you saw in the first uh, demonstration being in your uh, um, office at home and that you could do multiple things with multiple imaging at home. Well, at 300 megabits, you can do it. You can do it. We're sure of it. Uh, what we want to do is demonstrate in a city uh, that it can happen where people will use this network we are going to take 200 of our current users, we're looking very closely at who they might be, who are the folks who are going to innovate and experiment, and up the speeds. And we will do whatever they're on now, we're going to up it. And then see if we can't, together with the partners that uh, we will are putting together, we're talking to some hospitals right now, see if we don't uh, understand what the experimentation and innovation will bring for the future. So Great, that's what thanks. we're about. Thanks. Uh, Mark, uh, we've heard uh, mention of the competition that Mozilla is going to run for Ignite applications. Can you tell us a bit more about it, uh, you know, who you're trying to en en encourage to write applications, how the competition is going to work, what uh, cookies are there for the winners? Yeah, let me, let me back up and just say a little bit about how I, I think we got this far with the kind of creativity and the wealth of the internet that a number of the speakers talked about, because I think we're, we're at a spot where we're trying to do it again. Everybody in this room is trying to do it again. And so it's important to kind of look back at recent hi history. And I think you know, it goes without saying, 
it wasn't just the networks, it was the apps that you know, have built what we've got right now. And, and John said, you know, without email and, and the web coming out, you don't see this tremendous demand for networking. And so you know, we're, we're trying to, um, I think all of us in this room, do that again, but with things we can't even imagine now. I mean, nobody in 94, forget 94, the late 80s, would have ever thought that you could create a huge business on sending 140 characters around for your friends. And, and that's the kind of businesses we've built here. Uh, and you know, we've built them because what we've done is put out a set of building blocks that innovators who will probably be none of us in the room. I mean, this, this stuff is, is amazing. What Oblong is doing is amazing. So maybe there are a few of those innovators in the room. But really what we're trying to do is throw out there the building blocks that the people who have the Twitter of the future, but in huge 3D and lets you teleport to space and all of these kind of things, uh, will be able to do. And we can't imagine it now. And so the point is not to predict what the applications are, but to, to create the conditions that people can innovate and create wealth. And if you go back uh, and, and look at what happened with the internet we have now, you know, TCP IP is part of the story, the network is a part of the story. But an other critical piece is that we have HTML and JavaScript that the app environment, right, it's not just the apps, is a free and open set of building blocks that both anyone can use and that are compatible across a wide variety of devices. So what, and that's critical. You don't have Facebook, you don't have Google, you don't have Twitter, you don't have all of you know, Amazon, eBay, the e-commerce we have now without a common free set of tools at the network and the app layer to build out the thing that we have now. So what we want to see happen, and, and Mozilla has been very much a champion of the app layer, the HTML stack layer of that, is we want to pitch in by helping to build those same conditions, because we've got such brilliant people building the network layer. So we've, with NSF, uh, Susie is, is here somewhere, and uh, you know, it's been amazing to work with her team, are launching the Mozilla Ignite challenge today. Uh, the idea is to invite developers to come forward on top of Genie or, or other future generation networks with apps that show us what the future might look like, but using the next generation of open web technologies, so the very cutting edge of HTML5, which you, know, you don't think of HTML as having 3D and uh, two-directional teleconferencing or being able to pull data inside a video and manipulate it, but all of that is there in the edge of what's being implemented in HTML. So to invite people to use those technologies on these networks or to develop other open source building blocks that others are going to be able to use on these, uh, techn on these networks um, to fuel the next generation of innovation. And so very concretely, we've thrown out a challenge for people to, to kind of use those web standard technologies and Genie to uh, propose apps in healthcare, uh, in education, in other priority areas. The phase that opened today is a brainstorming phase. So anybody here can go say, here's what I think Twitter teleporting you to the moon looks like, draw it on a napkin, throw it in there. There's a, up to $15,000 in prizes for that napkin sketch round. But then it's where it gets interesting. We do a series of hack fests, we do a, a series of educational activities, and we start to work with uh, engineers who grab onto some of those promising ideas, and there's a little over $450,000 in prizes for the best apps that, that come out of that. And we'll go and we'll do you know, some of these local hack fests in places have got Genie networks, um, but we'll also just open this to anybody on the internet who wants to come in and say, hey, uh, this is what I can imagine, uh, here's my prototype. Um, and I think at the end of the day, we'll actually be able to see a bit of the future. Okay. Um, uh, uh, Deborah, I'm going to, you know, uh, take advantage you know, of, of, of your status here to explain something that uh, we, we talked about uh, you know, in, in preparing this. I don't think that people make this connection there. Everyone's talking about sometimes about wireless and the explosion there. Uh, these networks we're talking about, Ignite, are, are fiber networks there. What is the relationship? You know, be, are, are we taking from wireless by adding to, to, to fiber here? How does that work uh, between uh, wireless and fiber networks? Uh, so I'll happily answer your question, and then I want to come back and make sure that everyone gets what this uh, gentleman said, because it's hugely important. So first okay. of all, yes, behind, as we heard earlier from, uh, from John Donovan and Mark Anzi, right, implied is behind every smartphone is a broadband uh, network. And the closer it is, the better, right? We love wireless because it frees us to be mobile. 
but in other ways, we really like wires, right? As a medium, you want to send something on a wire as soon as you possibly can. It's an isolated medium. You're not, you know, uh, dispersing your energy, you know, off into the ether. So it's those last meters, yeah, last miles that we want to be wireless. But you, to deliver two-way, smart, effective applications, you have to have a broadband network infrastructure. And so it makes entire sense that as a government initiative, what is government about? It's about, and even public-private partnerships, it's about getting together to create essential infrastructure that no individual can afford to create. We create highways and we create essential broadband infrastructure to power our wireless and mobile networks. So absolutely essential, highly complementary. It doesn't have to be, we went through that decades ago, right? It doesn't have to be that every related US Ignite app is a gigabit per flow to the end device. It's that in aggregate, by bringing uh, gigabits to urban centers and rural centers, you're going to enable then the right amount of uh, bandwidth that's going to get me an effective app, and that's going to get the data that I need as close as possible to my wireless and mobile connection. Having said that, okay. I, I was much briefer than the others. Um, <laughs> uh, so far. Oh, yes. <laughs> um, Google and Facebook and all those, they have open APIs. Hugely important. That does not an open infrastructure make, right? So in creating US Ignite and creating this open ecosystem, it's about creating an open modular ecosystem where the underlying components get reused and so moments and, uh, and components of innovation then have multiplicative effects. And that's what I just want to use my airtime to reiterate what you said, that that's an opportunity. If we want to do it again, that's what we have to do again. You know, one theme I think that all of you are, are touching on is this idea of these networks will help us, as Chip said, live in, in the future, which is sort of fascinating because other news today is about these caps that we're seeing on, you know, on, on video here. And I guess these networks, if you had those caps, it, you'd fill it up like in a second, right? You know, uh, and it's a different mind frame, I guess, that we're talking about in living in the ultra high speed open world there. The, the, what, what, is it going to be like living in the future? What does that mean? What is it going to give to us if we get these ultra high speed, open, programmable networks? Go ahead. I'll be glad to take a whack at it, but I think all of us have some ideas. Um, I, I will refer back to who, who could have imagined that, uh, for example, Twitter, right? There are very, very unexpected outcomes to when you start living in these new spaces and opening. I, I remember uh, the day when I first saw web browsing and it was kind of a stunning revelation of we had had these networks for some time and somebody thought of a great application. Uh, that just really changed the way everything is. I think many of us in this room uh, have this kind of shared but somewhat inchoate sense that we're at another one of those transformative moments where it looks like a lot of the, the raw materials are shifting under us, a lot of things are beginning to open up again, but I don't think any of us can quite clearly see, hey, hey, what is it gonna be? And that's one of the really great things about Ignite is opening it up to people to just create things. Mm -hmm. uh, De De Deborah, do you see, you know, uh, in, the, in the academic world, how that is tra transforming that, when people have you know, access to the higher speed thing? Uh, yes, although I think also what's so exciting about it is that, is that students can know that ideas that they generate can actually happen out in the real world, that their local communities and remote communities are places where they can bring these innovations. Mm -hmm. So I think in, in part what's so exciting for me about the way Ignite has been posed mm -hmm. is that it recognizes that creating this infrastructure will ignite this kind of innovation and the ability to move innovation, uh, in innovation quickly. I've never been great at predicting the future, so I'll leave that to somebody else. But I would, I would say, you know, it's worth thinking about that there are two futures, at least that I see, and not just to be completely hopeful. Mm -hmm. Because I, I think we're actually at a really interesting juncture as we, we want to do this again, where we could have a network where the kind of attitudes that uh, lead to the caps, which is not purely a, a physical thing, it's a set of decisions about how we think about these networks, 
uh, a, a decision that's a little bit more controlled about how we imagine what these networks are for could be the future. And I actually don't think we'll have the innovation or the edge if that's the attitude that we go into these networks with. I think there's another version of this where they're open-ended, they're, you know, we see the economies of components that we can reuse and leverage, which means we get to innovations faster and cheaper. And I think actually the other part of that future is we see a world where 10, 20, 50, 80 percent of society actually knows how to code and reconfigure these networks where whether you're in construction or whether you're uh, in design or whether you're an engineer, this is an environment that you can innovate in. That's the future that I think gets really exciting. Uh, and I think we actually have to choose which of those futures to build. So I, I think I was listening to Professor Kurzweil just a while back, and uh, he said uh, biology is becoming, it, it is an information uh, science. This is this incredible notion. It finally got in my head. I said, ah. So what is that? That means that the flow of data and the image, now this, let's think about imaging right now. The imaging right now that's going on inside hospitals is, is it is futuristic. It's already out there. Mm -hmm. The question becomes, can you collaborate? Uh, can that be at home? Uh, so I imagine this situation where the patient is in the ambulance, so I do want some wireless technology at an LTE level, by the way, so I can uh, start to take some image here and get it right back to who wears the doctor. It's uh, 2 in the morning. Can that doctor be uh, awake and, and he's in his study, she's in her study, my daughter's going to be one of them, and looks up on the three screens and has the OCT uh, scan, has the new one as it's happening in a 360 degree uh, uh, image, and I can see that aneurysm, and I can tell the p person who's standing there, here's what is going to happen. I think that future is here if we enable it. And I think this kind of experimentation and those kinds of amazing minds are going to come together and say, here's what we can do for you right now, America. Here's what we can do for our patients this very minute. Uh, and I think it's enormously exciting. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. Can I just connect their two comments? Because that is a wonderful vision. And if you only have broadband wireless, the probability that the ambulance you get in is going to be able to get data to the doctor who happens to work for some particular system and that it's reimbursed. I mean, it connects to a whole bunch of other things. So we have to uh, hopefully generate a range of innovation that's not going to produce monolithic, siloed, entirely monopolistic systems that leverage those uh, uh, those technologies, right, to create profitable mm -hmm. industries, but one in which there is a notion of modularity and interoperability and that we create, we raise the bar on how you do that kind of innovation. I completely agree. I think this is an ecosystem that is multiplying by the day and, and the connections are an enormously exciting at this point and that we have to be able to talk to each other, not only so we'll look at the city of Philadelphia, but when I look at what's happening in Cleveland, of course, we want to be able to uh, uh, communicate across those cities and, w and we can already. That's already happening. What we want to see is can we, have, can we do that from our study? Can I do that doctor to doctor, uh, scientist to scientist, where they are anywhere they need to be? I think it is a combination of technologies and it's a combination of, of technologies, wired technologies and also those uh, that are on your computer and, and, and computer kinds of skills and, uh, um, and, the, and that multiplying and multiplying that's causing this, this explosion right now. Okay, um, now we do have time for uh, a, a couple questions here. I've been getting some in um, on uh, Twitter here, the, those ma magic 140 characters. And of course, in the future, <laughs> we'll do 140 uh, gigabits. Yeah, you know, uh, <laughs> yeah. people talking to, to each other there. Uh, it's interesting, a, a couple questions coming over on Twitter dealing just what we've been talking about for the last couple minutes of the importance of, of an open infrastructure and, and what that means. But let me uh, ask those in the auditorium this question. There's one right there. So I consume a movie, or I consume a, 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 a voice call, or an audio conference. I can map that reasonably well down to my bandwidth, which is usually the increment in which I pay for things in order to make this a, a viable ecosystem. Uh, I may not want to pay for the bandwidth. I want to pay for the movie or the voice <coughs> call, but that's—it's it, a fairly closely linked relationship. 
we go to this next model where we are dealing with applications that are mashups of other applications and they're now very <coughs> much more modular, the increment by which this is commoditized today is now two or three or more layers abstracted from my consumption. So unless the somehow the business model can change, I'm going to be paying for bandwidth that's being driven by intervening applications, which I have no visibility of, which are then mashed together to another set of applications that I'm actually consuming. So, and I, this gets to sort of the, the siloing effect, et cetera. Um, we're going to have to think about how we you know, commoditize and package this up, because I, as a consumer of that application, I'm not going to be willing to think about how much bandwidth okay, those eight applications is, uh, are tied together. Yeah. So, what is the what is the view on how this might be progress? How we move that that commoditization up to a higher level in a in a more modular, interconnected application? Of yeah, I'm supposed to summarize the questions for 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 the webcast, but uh, I guess this is like brain surgery. Um, <laughs> uh, basically, the question is, yeah, you know, about how it'll it'll be delivered and whether it'll be clear to the consumer in, in, in I guess in a, an effective way. Uh, but uh, he said it. And he, and it's just ha I think your question is, how what's the business model as this stuff gets more complex? And I I think that the you know. I, I'm old enough to remember that question in like 93 and 94 and nobody thought, oh my God, this web thing, how are we going to possibly make any money out of this? And well, you know, maybe the ISPs will do fine, but, uh, and so I, I actually think you can't see the business models until you start building the stuff, right? I mean, the, the business model for the, the iPod is incredibly different than what I think even anyone at Apple could have seen uh, when they first put the device out. And so I, I actually think that a leap of faith on business models um, knowing that there are smaller bits of monetization you'll get to earlier is, is what you have to do. It's a, it's a part of innovation. Okay. Uh, 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 other questions? And again, uh, let me remind the, uh, the web audience is hashtag US Ignite. Anything else? In the back. Uh, in the back. All right. Shout it out, please. Sure. Um, so it's great that you're talking about open networks and open architecture. Um, I, I never really thought of the internet as closed. Uh, it seems to me the internet itself uh, architecture is open and spawns an incredible amount of innovation today. So I guess my question is what is it that, why do you need the Gini network? Why do you need this new network separate from the internet to do innovation that you couldn't do with the internet network but just a lot of bandwidth? Okay, so the question is, you know, uh, why a, a second network? Why don't we just like supercharge the internet and, you know, then we'd have it. So I, I, don't, I don't think you're going to find anyone here who hates the internet, right? Uh, I use it every day, and possibly every 30 seconds. Uh, so I do like the internet. Um, but I think the internet is, you know, one of the things that made the internet such a terrific success was that you could put any software you wanted in your laptop or your handset or what have you. It was extremely open at the edges. You could put anything you want. If you know how to write software, you can create software and, and convince other people to, to buy it and install it in their laptops. But you can't do that in the firewalls, in the routers. You know, the network has a lot of structure inside, inside those LTE base stations. Right? You can't even see that, let alone install the software you want deep into the network. And so this is one of the really core Genie concepts is, hey, Let's make the entire network, all the way into the cloud, completely programmable. The kind of innovation that we have seen in laptops that made the internet such a huge success, what if we try to take that all the way and have you be able to program all the way through the network and create innovations all the way through the network? I think that one, that could be a real winner, right? It's too early to say yet, but the potential there, the number of opportunities for people being creative and opening up new things within the network. It, it's fantastic. Okay. Um, actually, I, you know, I, uh, we're running a little short here, but I really want to thank our panelists. I think it's been a terrific discussion. And now it's my great honor to introduce uh, uh, Todd Park, who is the uh, Chief Technology Officer of the United uh, States, who will be uh, giving the concluding remarks today. Um, uh,
Todd, you know, uh, has been, you know, the U.S. CTO since March. Uh, previously, he served at the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, uh, where he did uh, fantastic stuff. And he's a, a volcanic speaker and just the person to uh, send us <laughs> off to the workshops. Thank you. Thanks so much. Well, it's been a morning of just pure awesomeness. I just can't think of any other way to describe it. And so a few closing thoughts before we actually uh, all head to the, the breakouts. Uh, so we've had islands of next-gen broadband in this country. But as Deborah Estrin eloquently said, you need a critical mass of end users to really create value in the network. So just like uh, uh, one person with email, just one city with an amazing network or a single programmer with a groundbreaking app uh, has little chance of creating an entire new market. And so as we've discussed today, uh, we are coming together as a country to create a national network to interconnect these islands of next-gen broadband. And this will uh, truly give developers a broad platform for launching new high-speed applications that can catalyze the growth of this entirely new marketplace. Uh, in addition, this national nonprofit, this new national effort, is bringing together the capabilities and expertise of communities, industry, and universities from across the country. Incredibly, incredibly exciting to do actually together what uh, each institution set couldn't do by itself. Uh, there's a real growing need for high-speed applications and services in healthcare uh, to power remote patient monitoring, personalized medicine, surgery simulation like that incredible demo, uh, surgical theater, like every patient should actually have a surgeon who can benefit from that kind of power. And there's similarly massive opportunity to advance the ball significantly uh, in fields like education, training, advanced manufacturing, public safety, and clean energy as well. And I thought the panel put it best, the breakthroughs that will be most impactful are ones we can't even begin to imagine yet until we actually start building. Uh, there's this uh, famous saying by Mark Smith uh, that, um, who once said, uh, look, Amazon isn't Kramer Books with a computer in it, right? Travelocity wasn't a travel agency with a computer in it. It was an entirely new mode of delivering value to the public. It was unimaginable before the internet. And what I can't wait to see, what we all can't wait to see, <laughs> is the next generation of those kinds of breakthroughs. The, Amazons, the travel velocities that are unimaginable without this kind of next generation, high speed, programmable broadband network. We need to make sure that everybody in this country has a chance to contribute to and benefit from this amazing effort. And that's why the Mozilla US Ignite Apps Challenge that Subra and Mark Sermon announced is so incredibly exciting and important. Uh, the challenge in its $500,000 in prize funding gives every student, every startup, a chance to actually join the movement, create next generation apps that will improve the lives of Americans in so many ways we can't even begin to imagine, contribute to economic growth, and create good jobs of the future. It's initiatives like US Ignite that can really help unlock the power of American innovation mojo. Everybody in this room, uh, everybody watching, everyone involved with your companies, agencies, organizations should be incredibly proud of what you are doing for this country, the effort that we are launching here today. As you've heard from many folks, the president believes passionately in the power of all hands on deck, the power of innovation for the people, by the people, in the idea that if the private sector, the public sector, the academic sector, the nonprofit sector, the public in general come together as a team, there's no problem we can't solve. There's no opportunity we can't realize. There's nothing we can't do if we come together as a team, as America, to get stuff done. The effort that's launching today is a wonderful embodiment of this spirit. And we're so incredibly excited to get going on it. May the force be with us <laughs> and with US Ignite. God bless you all and God bless the USA. Thanks so much for coming and look forward to the breakouts. Rock on. <laughs>